Last time we met, we spoke about the advent of pulp paper making and how it changed both the paper and writing industry in one fell swoop. Suddenly, everyone had access to something to read, and as literacy rates increased, more and more people were opting to read the new pulp literature of the day. From crime-riddled story papers to fantastic and horrific penny dreadfuls, to dime novels full of made-up history and historical figures, to the pulp magazines and books that brought science fiction and fantasy to the fore, there was something, eventually, for every taste. And all of it became the inspiration for Gary Gygax and Dungeons and Dragons, as seen in Appendix N of the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Dungeon Master's Guide. Though not everyone was gung-ho about it all. As we discussed, there were many, many people who looked down on the various cheap reading materials and declared that they were unworthy of being read, and that the people who did read them were somehow less than the people who focused on reading and writing not only the classics of Western literature, but the soon-to-be new classics of Western literature. Look at these peasants, the sentiment seemed to be. By reading these filthy books with their grubby little stories, they debase themselves. If only they'd read the classics, they could be just like us. Good, right-thinking, wealthy, and influential. Why, almost human. They'd be so much less trouble if they just read better. Which is sort of the problem with people who look down their noses at the ways you choose to occupy your time. The base assumption is that if you only did what they did, and enjoyed what they enjoyed, and read what they read, why, you'd be a better person, just like them. Your life would be magically smoothed out and unruffled. You'd be able to think clearly and make better decisions, and then, why then you'd be a valued and valuable member of society. To do anything differently was to keep yourself out of the club of worthies. And naturally, being in the club of worthies was the best thing ever. Obviously. But equally obviously, there were several problems with this idea, even aside from the fact that it was a terrible way to treat people. The foremost problem was the inability to access the sorts of books that would at least let you look inside the club to see what it was all about. As we discussed, books of the sort deemed valuable to those higher up the ladder than you were were expensive to acquire. The whole point of pulp paper was to make things more affordable, but, of course, this wouldn't do for printing the best books. Why, to print such important literary works in such a cheap manner was to devalue them. It wasn't showing proper respect for the supposed quality of the ideas and words contained within. Far better to keep printing them on the more expensive and more labor-intensive rag paper, bind them in expensive leather, and only sell them in the most exclusive shops. You'd keep them out of the hands of the riffraff that way, since they couldn't afford them. Which was fine. Who wants the riffraff hanging about the place anyway? The second problem with these classics of Western literature was that since they were written and read by people of quality, they tended also to feature people of quality, doing the sorts of things people of quality do in the places people of quality go for the sorts of reasons people of quality can afford to have. The average Jane or Joe reader simply couldn't relate to what was on offer. They just weren't the sorts of people, settings, and plots that your average riffraff knew all that much about, not really being able to look into the club windows in the first place. And if it wasn't that, it was the patchwork knowledge of history, historical figures, and great thinkers that the average reader of the day had that meant even if you could look in the windows, you still had no common ground on which to communicate. So that worked to keep everyone out of the big parties on the hill as well. If you couldn't relate to the characters and situations, or just flat out didn't understand what the luminaries of the past were talking about, it was, and frankly still is, hard to see why you should even bother reading them in the first place. The third big obstacle to attending the swankiest parties was the fundamental inability to read the great works to begin with. Not because you didn't know how to read in general, remember literacy rates were on the rise, but because many of the great works were written in languages the average person had never learned to read in the first place. A large chunk of classic literature was only available in Greek or Latin, 
and most people not part of the church clergy, to whom reading and writing in Latin was restricted, simply weren't capable of reading and understanding the material for themselves. It's no good telling folks that these are the keys to the kingdom when they can't even find the locks they're meant to go in. And given the other problems, there was very little financial incentive for people to make translations for average Jane or average Joe so they could understand things too. Without anyone really trying or making much of an effort at all, lots of people were excluded from the great works at least until the late Renaissance and the onset of the Age of Discovery. After all, we can't let just anyone into the clubhouse. They'll get the carpets all dirty. Which is why, even today, so many people haven't read the majority of the classics of Western literature, myself included. While many are now produced in inexpensive volumes, they still seem distant, irrelevant, and are often challenging to read even when translated properly. Besides which, they all suffer from another problem that prevents the average reader from picking them up and getting into them. What's a classic book? How did it get to be a classic? And what's the point of reading one anyway? This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. We call a lot of things classic. There are classic works of literature, classic films, classic TV shows, and even classic Coke. But what does anyone mean when they say the word classic and then attach it to some sort of noun? And are we all supposed to just nod and agree whenever we hear it? If we turn to the classic reference work, Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, 11th edition, a publication that has been around in one form or another since 1828, and which I am currently using in its online version, though the classic dead tree version sits on the shelf not a foot away from me, we almost immediately encounter a problem. See, there are two different uses of the word classic, one of them as an adjective and one as a noun, which in itself is not a terrible problem, but becomes one when you realize that there are five separate definitions for the adjective and four for the noun version. A classic dictionary problem, a word used in so many different ways that it is hard to know at any given time which usage is meant without some further context located elsewhere in the sentence or paragraph in which it is read. For example, suppose I tell you I read a classic book. What do I mean? Do I mean I read a book whose story was of a high standard and recognized value? Something like Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky, for example. Or do I mean I read something written by the Greeks or the Romans, say, The Iliad by Homer? Or perhaps I meant that I read a historically or literarily significant book, Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Or maybe I meant that I read an authoritative, authentic, or typical book about a given subject, Maybe Hoyle's Book of Games by Edmund Hoyle. I can mean any, several, or even all of these things, depending on what book I actually did read and what I thought of it. And that's just classic in the adjectival sense. If I limit what I tell you to just the noun form of classic, as in, I read a classic, you're left to consider whether I meant a literary work of ancient Greece or Rome, a work of authority or excellence, a typical example, as might be implied by the phrase, this book is a typical book, or even whether or not I'd read a book at all, because classic can also mean a traditional event. Maybe I read the score sheet for Game 3 of the World Series. And never mind the unhelpful sentence, I read a classic classic. It's no use relying on the definition of classic unless you know a sufficient amount of the context in which it is being used. You could be talking about almost anything. Now, a number of you are probably listening to this and saying to yourselves, this is classic GM Word of the Week tomfoolery. Everyone knows what the classics are. Why not just look at the list of recognized classics and get on with it? But in a classic twist, it's just not that easy. There's no one list, and certainly there's no one central authority that decides what is and isn't on the list. Classic, as the word is generally used today in reference to literature, is meant to describe a literary work generally agreed by the majority of people who have had input on a particular work to be a work that best exemplifies the society and culture from which it comes. As such, it meets a high standard for quality, appeal, longevity, and influence. Or to put it another way, 
classic literature is considered among the best of all writing of its time, remains relevant and interesting down through the course of time, still has something to say to the modern reader regardless of when it was written, and has led to other significant works while also having an impact on the culture from which it comes. Consider these individually, though. The quality looked for isn't just good writing. It's more about artistic quality. Does the work present some essential element of life, truth, or beauty? Does it inspire the reader in some way? Do you come away from it seeing the world in a different way or influence to behave or think differently? By placing a microscope to life, does the writing illuminate something totally new or reveal something unknown until now? Does it speak to universal or individual truths, or is it written in such a way that it becomes beautiful in itself? Even if the work was written centuries ago, does it still have meaning today while still being representative of the time in which it was written? And more importantly, is it old enough to have proven itself? Upon asking my fourth grade teacher what made a book a classic, I was told the book had to be at least 50 years old, as if that was the only requirement. But even that isn't enough when it comes to the sort of universal classics we're talking about here. At the time, I was wondering why fantasy and sci-fi books I enjoyed weren't considered proper classics, and while it was true that many of the titles I could think of at the time were not yet classics in the larger sense, and certainly weren't 50 years old or more, some of them were, even at the time, considered not only classics of their genres, but actual full literary classics. Most, though, simply hadn't been around long enough to prove their qualities. Even the best of recent writings, no matter how well done, how appealing, and how influential, have yet to stand the test of time. The other point on which my beloved sci-fi and fantasy novels would have fallen down is universal appeal. And the point is not that they were sci-fi and fantasy, so of course they didn't have universal appeal. The point was the themes they dealt with were, by and large, not of universal appeal to such a degree that they were capable of speaking to a wide audience regardless of their interests. Themes like love, hate, death, life, and faith were, in the case of most literary classics, things that everyone could relate to regardless of their social class, status in life, or background. The classic speaks in some way to everyone about essential themes, ideas, and beliefs we all share. And just so I'm clear on the point, there are some genre novels that qualify as genuine classics, but by and large, the genres are still too young as a whole to have developed the sort of broad appeal needed. The literary classic is also something that can be read again and again, and from which the reader can derive new meaning and understanding each time. A book read in your youth might contain one set of lessons or ideas, but when the same book is read later in life, say as a 20 or 30-something, with a new station in life and new responsibilities, or as a more senior reader with broad life experience behind them, new lessons and ideas can be had. Not because the book has changed, but because you have. It might even be necessary for a classic to be read more than once in order to fully appreciate its value as your perspective changes. Classic literature acts as a sort of nexus of ideas, both flowing into the work itself and flowing out of it to subsequent works by others. Classics serve not only to define a particular place and time in history, but also all the places, times, and people leading up to them. Often this influence is an unconscious one, a product of simply being written by a living, thinking writer alive at that particular time. And just as previous works influence the writer in writing, so too does the classic influence those who come after. That's another part of the reason a new classic needs time, to see if it will influence future writers, often to classics of their own. The whole idea of the Western canon of which the literary classics are considered to be a part, and if you're confused about the word canon, please see our classic episode, Canon. The whole idea of the Western canon is that it represents not only the best and brightest in literature, but also art, music, and philosophy, which also lays the foundation for much of Western culture. By reading the classic literature of the Western canon, the reader is bound to develop the intellectual, philosophical, and historical context to not only understand what Western culture is all about, 
but to also be able to think and act in the best possible traditions of Western culture. By reading the classics, you will be able to fully take part in and appreciate what it means to be part of that culture. So, presuming you want to better understand Western culture and your role in it, read the classics. Well, the classics of Western literature, at least. Because, you see, for as many different cultures as there are, there are also classics of art, philosophy, literature, and everything else besides for each. Each culture produces foundational works, which help define and explain the place of the participants of that culture within their own society and in relation to others. So if you want to begin to understand other cultures, read their classics. Classically, there's more to it than just a list of books you should read in order to be considered a functioning member of your culture, though. As we said before, there's no one list to which everyone agrees. At one time, practically every college had a list of classics recommended and taught to its students, but no two lists completely agreed. It depended in large part on what each college's goal was in teaching the classics and what their overall curriculum intended. Then along came various scholars and publishers with lists of their own, and while many items on the lists overlapped with other lists, many did not. However, overall, the goal was to achieve something called a classical education, which everyone agreed was important and never argued about ever, especially since the definition of classical education changes practically any time someone brings it up. The basic idea of the classical education and the format which most people agree constitutes the foundation of a classical education is something called the trivium, which lays the foundation for the liberal arts and has been around since at least the medieval era. And there's a lot of explaining to do, so hold on. First, trivium is medieval Latin for the meeting of the three ways, or crossroads, and it represents the earliest stage of learning. In the earliest years of schooling under a classical education, most of the time is spent learning facts. By laying facts in, the idea is that a solid foundation of basic essential knowledge is developed. All that time you spent learning the capital of South Dakota, how many presidents there were, and how to stop spelling banana? Those were the bricks being laid in as the foundation of the first part of a classical education. They didn't mean a lot, because you had yet to really grasp the context necessary to process them, but that was just the first part of the trivium. The second part is the middle grade years, where students are meant to learn to think through arguments. Not the bickering sort of arguments, but the kind of arguments that ask you to evaluate two or more ideas against each other. Basically, the whys and wherefores of the knowledge you were being exposed to. How do we know that we're supposed to point and laugh at flat earthers? How is government really meant to work? Why is five not the answer to what is two plus two? All of which is informed by the foundational knowledge you hopefully absorbed while it was all still just facts to know. Now you were meant to be able to explain why things were as they are. The third part of the trivium is meant to occur during your high school years, where the student is supposed to be learning how to express themselves. Having applied foundational facts to understanding the world as it is, can you then work out and say what it is you actually think about these things? Can you articulate your thoughts? Are you capable of thinking original thoughts? And can you take all the facts and reasoning you've learned and use them to support your own ideas and make yourself understood? Can you, in fact, demonstrate the ability to connect knowledge of all sorts together into a cohesive, interconnected argument that supports some new thought in a logical, well-reasoned way? Can you write an episode of GM Word of the Week? This is the trivium, and classically, its three stages are referred to as grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Grammar is concerned mostly with language skills like reading, writing, and vocabulary. Logic is meant to teach the process of correct reasoning, and rhetoric focuses on debate and composition, each one building on the last. After the trivium has been mastered, secondary education focuses on the quadrivium of arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. After that, well, after that, you were expected to go apprentice yourself to someone in the field of your choice, 
Though universities would offer lessons in theology and philosophy if you were somehow uninterested in a real job. Of course, as mentioned, every time you looked around to see what a classical education was, it was different from the last time you looked. No one seemed quite sure from century to century, or even year to year in some cases, what a classical education was meant to offer, only that everyone should have one, and at the end of it, everyone should be able to enter society as a reasoning, thinking, and productive member of that society who knew roughly all the same things as everyone else and could apply it all equally well. The heart of a classical education was, of course, the ability to read and be well-read, which is where the Western canon and classical literature came in. If you read the right books and thought about them the right way, you'd be practically guaranteed to have a successful life, because you would be able to read and write on a variety of subjects, using logic and reasoning, learned in the classics, to express yourself clearly and correctly, as demonstrated by those same classics. It all hangs together and feeds itself, or was meant to, based on the ability to read classic literature. But what should you read? What was essential to know and understand? What was the base you should lay to work up from? Well, most everyone agrees there should be some Aristotelian ethics in there, along with Plato's dialogues, just to get the thinking right. Certainly you want Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, Sophocles, Euripides, and Aristophanes to get in some early playwrights, Aesop's fables would probably provide a minimum baseline of ethics backed up by Plutarch. As for the Roman writers, Cicero for rhetoric and philosophy, among other things, and definitely Virgil for his early poetry, along with Ovid. Don't forget Beowulf. Get Dante in there. A little Machiavelli, of course. Definitely read Don Quixote, La Mort de Arthur, and the Canterbury Tales. Some guys named Marlowe, Shakespeare, and Johnson for those plays. Isaac Walton's Complete Angler, Milton's Paradise Lost, Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, and pretty much everything by Jonathan Swift. You'll want all of Montaigne's essays, Voltaire's Candide, Goethe's Faust, Hugo's Les Miserables, and Balzac's The Girl with the Golden Eye, among others. Grab most anything by Ibsen, Blake, Wordsworth, and Coleridge. Jane Austen, of course, but also Elizabeth Gaskell, Mary Shelley, and the Brontes. Lewis Carroll, Charles Dickens, and Robert Louis Stevenson all have their place, as does Bram Stoker, the brothers Grimm, and Oscar Wilde. Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, and Chekhov get you some Russians. Nietzsche for, well, Nietzsche. And for the Americans, you want Irving, Cooper, Emerson, Hawthorne, Melville, Poe, Longfellow, Alcott, Henry James, Mark Twain, and Emily Dickinson. And that's not even a complete classics list. That's just one cherry-picked list from a selection of hundreds. Which even then isn't completely inclusive, because anyone can produce a list of books that should be read as classics. The major publishing houses certainly maintain numerous lists of classics, both old and new. In particular, Penguin Publishing is known for their line of Penguin Classics, which includes not only authors like Ovid, but also Wu Ching-in and the classic Chinese mythology of the Monkey King, along with 1001 Nights, and collections of regional short stories and works by Hemingway, Joan Didion, right next to A.A. A. Milne's Winnie the Pooh stories. Or perhaps the Everyman Library is more your thing, containing as it does works from Benjamin Franklin, Kafka, Victor Hugo, John Muir, Sun Tzu, and a wide selection of other voices. Even better, if you're in college, ask around about your college's great books program and see what they have on offer. These days, you'll get quite a broad-spectrum offering worth checking out. And so, in a classically classic wrap-up, use the word classic carefully. After all, you wouldn't want to see the Twilight series or Fifty Shades of Grey on your future grandchild's university reading list. Oh, never mind. They already are. Classic. Thanks for listening to this episode of GM Word of the Week. I'm glad you took the time. If you've enjoyed this episode, consider throwing some support our way. Ratings and reviews are always appreciated on whatever listening platform you have, and telling your friends about us is nice as well. Of course, you can always pledge your support to the show at buymeacoffee.com 
slash fiddleback, where we've adjusted the levels a bit so it's easier on your pocketbook. GM Word of the Week is a Fiddleback production and is researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey. Music is by Blue Dot Sessions. A classic is a book that doesn't have to be written again.